answering questions for me for us, which is great. Thanks. It's about time Michelle did something for us. Mm -hmm. Hey, I help out a little bit more than that, I hope. I'm just giving you a hard time. <laughs> Um, all right. Anything specific? Anything uh, you need me to chime in on? No? Okay. Um, so, Dave, you were thinking we'd just kind of keep pressing forward with some of this, uh, you know, more didactic type stuff? I think so. And again, as you talked about, you know, just kind of try and get them a little more engaged with it, see what their opinions are, just kind of carry a little conversation as we do it. Yeah, it's all good. We we got through so going through the PowerPoint that we did that we had the introductory PowerPoint stuff um, last time. I think we got into some of the primary lumbar pathologies. Um, we mm -hmm. didn't get yeah. directly into the um, you know profiles, the, those illness script type of uh, types of things that we see with with the individual ones. So we can go over those things today. That's good to know them. Um, yeah, let's pick up where you'd be in your presentation or that didactic portion that you would typically do. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a good idea. There. There's plenty of stuff that we can keep going over once we get into the class. Mm -hmm. So that's probably yeah. good to get this stuff out of the way. All right. Well, let me see if I can share my screen here. All right. We seeing this? Mm -hmm. I can see it. Yep. Okay. So we talked, we got onto this, this page, this is a slide last time, um, looking at kind of the three major types of lumbar pathology, right? So we talked about disc pathology and the fact that there's, there's kind of different types of categorization of these things, um, that for whatever reason, doesn't seem to trickle over into the rest of the healthcare, um, community, right? So, um, <clears throat> sorry, um, looking down here at the bottom of what, what I typically get when I get a script that, about a disc uh, issue is just HNP, right? HNP L45 or something like that. I'm sure most of you all see the same thing, but um, unfortunately, herniation, the actual term herniation has a very specific meaning to it. It means that there has been migration of tissue from its preset area where it's supposed to be to some other area, right? So herniation in the lumbar spine and any, in any portion of the spine really implies migration of the nuclear material throughout the uh, annular structures and potentially beyond that if it's extruded, right? So um, we were talking a bit about that and herniations. Um, if you look at some of the stuff that Jim has, um, about talk, discussing herniations in general, it is a absolute catastrophic injury to the disc. Um, it is very bad. Um, in most cases, these sort of things will deteriorate. Um, they'll either be turn themselves into instabilities um, or they'll require some sort of surgical intervention. It very much depends on the the extent of these sort of injuries, um, but it's, it's a bad deal. It's not good. Um, there are different kinds um, when we look at herniations. So an external herniation, that's the kind that we're that Jim's talking about typically where there's, um, you know, loss of containment of some of that nuclear material. It's extruded. It's actually into the canal. Um, and, you know, now we're dealing with that sort of tissue irritating the neurologic tissue in and around it, right? So that's one of those catastrophic type of things. A contained disc herniation means that the annular fibers around it are still intact. So we get the the nuclear material will migrate. Um, so if we go if we go this way, it'll go in this direction, but it's not going to penetrate the exterior. Um, it's still exceptionally painful in most cases, but they don't have the same type of peripheralized symptoms where we're dealing with radiculopathy, you know, so we have uh, fatigable weakness where we have sensory changes, reflex changes, that sort of stuff. Um, but they probably very, they very likely will have um, same, same sort of uh, antalgic posture. They'll very likely still be shifted away from those things in most cases. Um, so th those are things that we have to take into consideration. It's also possible to have vertical herniations. Um, these are called Schmorl's nodes, basically where it fractures the end plate 
of the bone. Um, and it, this will essentially be problematic in such that it, it will tend to introduce blood into the disc material. And blood is very caustic to the disc material. It'll tend to chew it right up. Um, kind of almost liquefies the, the nuclear material to a certain extent. Um, Gail Malloy used to tell me that you had to have had blood introduced to a to the nuclear material at some point in order for it to herniate in the first place. Um, I'm not entirely certain that that's physiologically 100% true, um, but it would make sense that the nuclear material, if it is patent, if it is intact, that it wouldn't tend to migrate on its own. So if we have an end plate lesion of some sort um, and blood is introduced into that nuclear material and that starts to um, affect the uh, molecular structure of that nuclear tissue, that could allow those sort of tissues to start to herniate and to start to, to move um, within, within some of the you know, like radial tears and things like that, little fissures that we get within the annular material. Dave, do you have any um, specific thoughts about how those uh, herniations are caused? Or at least how they develop from that perspective? No, I, I don't. And, you know, I can understand where I think you'd say it should say the blood component could be there, but I don't know if that would be an absolute and how I understand it. And yeah, and, that, and that's... It. That's kind of exactly how I thought of it. I was like, oh, well, you know, as a young, as a young therapist, it's like, okay, well, that, you know, that gives me some very specific um, thought mm -hmm. points on how, you know, when you see somebody coming in with those significant issues, um, especially like an externalized herniation where you're like, oh, okay, well, we're, we're really dealing with this. There must have had some sort of end plate lesion. Well, you know, I, I think at, at times you can have avulsion tears, things of that sort of nature, which again would be considered an end plate lesion. Yeah, um, but you can also have radial issues where where the disc itself, where the uh, nuclear material can actually migrate. But I, I think it requires. I do believe it probably does require substantial injury in order for that sort of thing yeah. to happen, right? So when we think about that sort of thing, it, it becomes different. You have to differentiate that sort of mechanism, a herniation, to things like a protrusion, where it's actually the annular fibers have weakened. The annular fibers have um started to protrude and take up space within the uh, neural frame and things of that sort of that sort of area right so but that doesn't imply change in position of the nuclear material and these things we i think we do see a lot i think the common posterior lateral protrusion is a relatively normal thing for us to run into in the clinic doesn't always necessarily cause neurological symptoms doesn't always necessarily cause um, radiating type of pain. So that's the type of pain that occurs immediately with movement of the trunk. So um, for instance, if I were to bend forward at the waist and I have a um, substantial disc lesion, that would s substantially increase the posterior leg pain, right? Zing, goes right down the leg. It's instantaneous. Um, you know, same sort of thing with a uh, pyramidal compression in the neck. So we go into like a spurlings position, zing, there it is, you know, lightning bolt down the arm. Those are what we call radiating pains. They, they occur instantaneously. Um, I do think it's possible to have referenced pains that are more of a summative effect, right? So these, those sort of issues are um, repetitive stress, right? So it's something like, well, if I go, if I walk, for long periods of time, um, and that starts to produce a referenced pain. It's more of a dull pain. It's more of an aching type of pain. Um, it could be a little more sharp, um, but typically it's it's this dull, achy type of sensation that starts to manifest in the in the posterior limb, lower limb, lower extremity, I should say. Um, but it, it takes a certain amount of a particular activity for that sort of thing to come on. That's what we consider a referred pain um, mm -hmm. versus a radiating pain occurs instantaneously with one movement, right? So I bend forward with a significant disc protrusion, zing, the pain goes right down my leg. It's immediate, happens right away versus me bending forward with a referenced pain. It may require me bending forward multiple times, whether that's in the gym 
or doing yard work or sitting in a car for prolonged periods, things of that sort of nature, where it's this repetitive or sustained stress that eventually starts to reference pain into the limb. So I do think there needs to be some um, differentiation between the two um, because we can get referenced pain from non-neurological structures, things like a facet joint, things like a joint capsule, things like a multifidi muscle, um, the periosteum, the, uh, I even think the dura itself, because the dura itself is not a true neurological tissue. It's a connective tissue. Um, so I think irritation of the dura or pressure on the dura, I think we see this more commonly in clinics where we put somebody into a slump test and they say, yeah, that I feel that down into my leg. Um, and you say, well, okay, is it, you know, what type of pain is it? Is it, it's, is it this true um, causalgia type pain or, or lancinating type pain? Most patients don't have that, right? Most patients that come in with true lancinating type pain, we never get them into a slump position because it's too painful for them to sit in general versus having to actually tension the neurological structures um, in order to elicit that pain. Do you, you think, how do you, what do you, how do you feel about that, Dave? No, it's, it's exactly, as soon as that person comes in and have pain, first thing I like to differentiate is, okay, what type of pain do I have? You know, you know, is it, is it neuropathic pain or radicular pain? You know, radicular pain is, yeah, I get this pins and needles or this paresthesia that's going down to my foot, you know, that I may expect to see more company and weakness versus that person that, yeah, I have this achy back pain, it's dull, it goes in my buttocks, it's down my thigh, maybe lateral cleft, which is that referred kind of nociceptive pain. You know, so I have inflammation of any multiple structures, like Eric said, in the back that can give that type of pain. And the other pain is more that neuropathic, that lancinating, causalgic, electric pain is that ectopic discharge of the nerve, which is going to send that shooting pain down the leg. So kind of like, I guess, three kind of pain types I'm looking for. And what you can have is, is that when somebody presents with one, I know that there's the chance that they may come back the next time with the other comment I saw this week or last week was that that person who comes in with kind of a cloward sign in the thoracic spine from coming from the cervical spine, you know, my tone was five out of five, sensory fine, reflexes fine, you know, comes in two days later now with paresthesias, you know, arm weakness, you know, C7 weakness. The first time I saw them, they had more of the nociceptive or the inflammatory pain that was going on. And as this thing progressed, they progressed on with more neuropathic type symptoms hmm. that came in. And so you'll see these individuals and when they come in with one, I keep the open mind that I'm seeing this one, but there's always the chance that it, it's going to morph. And sometimes what we see is we see them come in with only pins and needles down the leg and no back pain. So we just have neural irritation from inflammation or mild grade compression, but they don't have that local nociceptive input. Yeah. And that's one that you have to be cautious of or, or careful with. If you have a patient that comes in with, especially paresthesias, so something that you would consider to be a neurological symptom, but no back pain, um, those are ones that you have to take with a, a little more um, tact because the thought is, is that, okay, why are we developing neurological symptoms without the associated local pain? Right. So where is the trauma that ca that's causing this neurological symptom? Um, because the, the thought is, as well, is this a slow developing impingement here of some of the neurological tissue? And it's just like, well, you know, what's a slow developing, you know, space occupying problem that could manifest with neurological symptoms, but no local pain? Well, one of the things that you have to consider is a tumor. Um you know, you can get it with things like stenosis, for instance, like a, a lateral stenosis that develops, you know, scar tissue that builds up slowly over time. Um, but generally, if you start developing neurological symptoms, you know, radicular symptoms, but no local, um, no local trauma, no local um, pain symptoms, um, you got you got to take that and kind of look at it and be like, well, you know, what, what could we potentially be having here? Um, that, that could be setting off neurological problems um, without a local pain. It does happen. I mean, like I said, with scarring, that sort of stuff can be possible. Um, but, you know, at a certain point, you still would have expected, especially if you have scarring, you still would have expected some sort of trauma to that area 
to set off some sort of inflammatory process to build up the scar tissue. Um, you have to have something, some sort of stressor to build up scar tissue. Now it can be inflammatory. It can be pressure related. Um, it could be friction related, all of those sort of things. Um, but there's got to be something there to instigate that, that, uh, scar tissue buildup. Otherwise, if it's something that Eric, just comes up. Question? Eric, yeah, when you're when you're talking about that, are you talking like acute disc lesions or chronic disc lesions or both? When I'm talking about neurologic symptoms with no local pathology? No, more the scarring that you're talking about. Well, it could be anything, right? So it could be, it could have been a trauma to the pars, right? So some sort of fracture at the pars will we'll set off an inflammatory process, right? Structural damage like that tends to do those things. It could be damage to the joint capsule, a little bit harder to do in isolation, um, but it's definitely possible. Um, so any one of those things that develops and disc lesions, you know, a disc lesion would do it as well. Um, anything that develops that is going to produce some sort of inflammatory reaction in that area, if it's untreated, then it will perpetuate and it'll continue to be there. And the idea of having um, stagnant inflammatory exudate around healthy tissue will produce scarring. Um, it happens relatively quickly. I, I think I've read that it happens as starts to begin as quickly as three days after the fact, which seems kind of overwhelmingly fast because three days mm -hmm. isn't even past the initial inflammatory phase of healing. Um, but if you think about it from that perspective, you, you got to expect within that first week, once the once the inflammatory process should be dying down from a natural healing perspective, um, if it hasn't uh, abated completely, then that scar t that that uh, sorry that infl inflammation that an exudate within that tissue, the pressure from that and the irritation that chemical irritation that's that inflammatory process has, will start to scar the tissue around it. Um, so it does happen pretty quickly. Um, it's just a matter of how chronic is that. So yes, chronic inflammation will lead to scar tissue. That's just the nature of the game. Um, but it could be from other sources as well. Like I said, friction could be from, uh, compressive pressure, any of those sort of things, any abnormal pressure on a particular tissue for prolonged periods will, will eventually, uh, develop some sort of scarring around it. Does that answer your question, Teresa? Yeah, it does. I have a particular patient right now who's just kind of at the forefront of my mind as we're talking about all this. Um, he... Yeah. He had an acute incident. We had like an icy day here in St. Louis a few weeks ago that he slipped and jolted, but caught himself, didn't actually slip and fall, and then developed significant debilitating low back pain. He came in direct yeah. access before um, he even like saw his doctor, got an MRI, and I was thinking, oh, this is like super acute. This is going to be an easy home run. I'm going to you know, have this guy believing in our healthcare system because I'm just going to be able to help him really quickly and, and this will be great. And he's a really heavier set individual. And um, <clears throat> my testing was really hard because he was so, so, so flared up. I mean, couldn't, his, his lumbar flexion was maybe 40 degrees, couldn't even get to an erect position, all your common disc, um, presentations you know he didn't want to sit down he he didn't even want to really he kept shifting his weight didn't want to be weight bearing on either leg and we had visit six just the other time and or the other day and i finally tried dry needling because i have been completely unable to find anything that alleviates any of his symptoms he feels worse after therapy and mm. <clears throat> I don't know that my testing was even truly, um, you know, really revealed everything because he's just so flared up. Yeah, true. That, does he have, and he, does he have neurological symptoms? He did have radiating pain down both sides. He both had sides. a positive, yeah, both sides. Um, he had a slump. He had a straight leg raise. Um, reflexes mm -hmm. were fine, but you know, he had weak, everything hurt any type of muscle testing. I did hurt. Um, 
and he quit on me and I feel like I failed him because I couldn't find a dang thing to help him. And he's gotten an MRI and he's just kind of in that roundabout that is the healthcare system that he's seeing his primary and his primary doesn't know what the heck to do for him. So really yeah. he's coming to therapy and all I'm doing is educating him on what he needs to do. You know, go ahead, get a referral. Let's get you in to see a, a spine specialist or a pain management specialist. You know, I don't know if maybe you just want to go an injection route and um, nothing, absolutely nothing I did for him alleviated a minuscule of his symptoms. So he had, he had an MRI, you said? Yes. Yes. And, the MRI and, it, 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 and it showed herniated discs, um, mm -hmm. four and five. He, I didn't physically get to see it. This was what he told me. Um, yeah. And he, you know, oh, I, I have a printout at home. I'll bring it. And he never did. Um, but he's also a really, really heavier set individual. I, I, you know, mm -hmm. he could have, those could have been present previously and completely asymptomatic. Right. Well, and that's, and that's always the question mark, right? So herniated discs, right? If that's what the, if that's what the report says, it's just like, well, if he's having symmetrical radiating symptoms into both limbs, what type of herniation would do that? It would have to be a central herniation, right? It would have to be getting both yes, nerve yes. roots as they pass by at the same in the same spot, right? So I, I don't buy into that, that that's going to be the case. Um, just because the symmetry of that sort of thing to have it the same on both sides is it's unlikely. Um, you're more likely to have, if he has previous disc degenerative change, right? So premature breakdown of one of the lumbar segments or multiple lumbar segments, potentially, um, it's more likely that the slip, right? So you're saying he didn't actually fall, didn't hit it. Yeah. He caught himself. Or anything like that. It's more likely that the change in disc integrity Right. So the disc starts to break down, starts to narrow to some extent because of old, you know, annular issues or or even nuclear issues within the disc material, the disc structure. Um, what we get with that is we talked about this a bit last week when we're looking at the if you look at the screen here and we're talking disc pathology, we talked about the progression that we get from disc lesion to instability to stenosis, right? So the disc pathology as that starts to break down, the annular fibers themselves have a um, reflex mechanism that is connected to the multifidi. Okay, this was actually documented by a, a spine surgeon. I forget the guy's name, um, but they were doing they were doing a discectomy and they're going in and they're starting to work on the disc material itself. And they noticed that when they put pressure on the annular fibers of the disc, that the multifidi would twitch. Right. So How do they a, put pressure just on the annular fibers? They were going in to do a discectomy. So they're going in to clean out oh, the, oh, oh, okay, okay. the annular fibers, right? Mm -hmm. So they're going in, it, it's a surgical procedure. And so this is this is just a it was a happenstance sort of thing that they found as they were doing this procedure, is they noticed when they started putting pressure on those annular fibers that the multifidi would twitch. And so the thought process is as they start going in and doing, um, you know, histo histological studies on the annular fibers is they found mechanoreceptors within the annular fibers that actually they trigger a reflex recruitment of the multifidi, especially the deeper fibers of the multifidi, the ones that are very um, immediate for that particular uh, inner segmental space. So say L4, L5, um, they're more specific to that. The deeper you get into those multifidi fibers, they're more specific to that particular level. Um, so you start seeing these reflexive um, happenings with the, with the uh, with the muscular tissue. And so when you start thinking about what that does, if we have degradation of the uh, disc material, right? And so the disc starts to kind of flatten out, almost like it's kind of sagging. Um, you know, like a balloon that's losing some of its air, right? All of a sudden, you lose the ability to tension those annular fibers um, 
because it, it takes more movement of the two segments in relation to each other for you to tension those annular fibers enough to get that reflexive recruitment of the multifidi. So now you're banging into these articular structures. You're banging into the joint surfaces. You're banging into the long ligaments. You're banging into the joint capsules before you're tensioning the annular fibers. And so all those other tissues start to take more stress, more stress, more stress. They start to break down as well. Um, so essentially when that sort of thing happens, you start, you get this snowball effect where the disc pathology progressively turns into an instability and then as you start pounding away on all those other structures around it, um, like I said, um, the joint uh, surfaces themselves, the long ligaments, the um, joint capsules, et cetera, any, any of these other um, inert structures that are supposed to help with stability, they just start getting all this stress because now the annular fibers are doing nothing and we're getting no help from the multifidi because they're just not able to turn on. They're not getting told. They're sitting there waiting to do their job and nobody's telling them, Hey, you need to turn on to help us out here. You need to do these, these little help, help us self-correct these things that they can't hear it. You know, the, uh, the, the, the phone line has been cut and they can't get, they can't hear anything. So they just don't turn on. So that starts to break down those tissues. You start to develop scar tissue. That is where we start to progressively move into the lateral stenosis or central stenosis realm as that scar tissue starts to build up. So my thought with the patient that you're describing to us is if they have old disc pathology, they very likely, if it's chronic, if it's been there for a long period of time, they very likely have started to develop some sort of intersegmental instability. And so my first thought would be you're dealing with some sort of shift um, in that segment. And that's why it's getting both legs that's why it won't correct. That's why the, you know, nothing on the imaging is showing up as being so symmetrical that it's telling us like, oh, well, look at the size of this huge central herniation that's compressing the thecal sac here going down, you know, through these lumbar levels. Um, and, that, and that's why it seems like things are failing for him is because it, it's actually the positional fault of one of the lumbar segments. That, that would be my first thought. Um, I don't know. I'll let, Dave, what do you think? I'll let somebody else kind of chime in. Here yeah. I mean, it's either going to be like a chronic tinnitus, like it's, it's got an acute inflammation or irritation that's there. Or as you said, is it this, the, the shifting segment? I now have this thing that's become like a stage two instability where we can't kind of get stability. So you're going to hang on the annual ligaments, you know, his comorbidities there are high. So like statistically getting those things is like every time, okay, he's obese, probably job occupation, pain meds, things of that nature, you know, but fortunately those things do kind of are predictive of a, you know, maybe a poor outcome in this individual. The fact that you can't find a position of ease or a pain relieving position, you know, never really bodes well in these cases. So mm -hmm. oftentimes it is, it's that, it's that shifting. He's probably so big that, you know, to do a posterior to anterior, any type of shear testing on him, you probably didn't think to do one because of his pain level or two, just because he's so big. It's like, okay, am I going to feel it? But I'd expect something like that may be there as well. That he's there's a yep. shifting or something that's keeping this thing irritated from that uncontrolled segment that's yep. going on. And these people are they are these what you describe there is probably one of the more challenging patients, like in the book as they come in. Because you're yeah, looking so, in, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so they're gonna be it's gonna be hard to find that pain adaptive model in him. Treatment wise with someone like this, Eric and Dave, what what would be your first line of treatment for him in your how, attempts of like, did, let me. How long did you treat him? Six visits and he quit on me. Six visits yeah, over not enough. three weeks? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, not nearly enough. The, mm. In the first visit, it would be this person, I would be writing something down and giving it to him with clear expectations. Listen, you know, this is going to be a road. This is going to be eight weeks. You know, from start to finish. Oh, with and this, I, Oz yep, yep. I, I gave him, I gave him that spiel. You know, trust the process, and and I, each visit, mm -hmm. like you know, I hammered it, and it was heavy on education. I think I, my time was worth it for him because he was clueless on where to go next and what to do, and mm -hmm. you know, I kind of explained the process of the next step, and like your primaries are not going to do crap for you, and you got to get in to see someone, and 
but like mm-hmm. physically treating this patient hands on, like what is something that, what would be your first step to see if you could have alleviated any kind of pain for him? Well, so for me, the the first thing would be, so the symptoms as you're describing them, you know, radiating pain into the limbs, uh, antalgic posture, not wanting to sit for long periods, you know, not, not being, you know, not comfortable standing on one leg or the other. Um, if you look at it from that perspective and you say, well, it looks like a disc, you could mm-hmm. say the best thing for that type of disc issue is some sort of extension protocol. So yeah. bone extension would be the ideal thing. Some patients can't handle it. It's just too much off the bat. But I, I mentioned this case that I saw with Earl Petman years ago where um, they, he went, you know, patient came in, looked like a, you know, very common disc protrusion. And Earl's just like, well, we're going to get you right into some prone extension here. That over, that that hydrostatic pressure overcoming the osmotic pressure of the inflammation. Basically, you're compressing all that inflammation and pushing it back into the drainage mechanism. So into the vertebral spongiosa. Um, to drain that inflammatory exudate from around the neurological tissue. Um, and what ended up happening, he puts them on the table, right? And he takes the table and the the, butt, the end of the table and he tries to lift it up in order to get him into extension. And we hear this huge crack coming from this guy's back. And it turned out that it was an anterior shift that had, tra- that had when he, we put him into extension, it translated posteriorly. Remember we were talking about the Um, orientation of the facet joints and they have this little bit of a curvature to them so we get this this upper segment hits that little curvature and all of a sudden we get this hinging motion where it's starting to kind of tilt backwards and it hits something and then it pivots and it goes straight backward Um, that's what ended up happening is he had this significant anterior shift and probably a guillotine lesion where we have the two portions of the neural foramen and it was shifted forward closing that down compressing uh the neurologic structure so when we when we hinged him backward and you get that uh pressure on those articular facets instead of it doing this sort of thing where it was just kind of moving back like that it hit here and then it hinged backward and opened that wide open and so his symptoms immediately disappeared so that would have been my first thing is let's try and see if we can work this guy into an extension pro, uh, position to see if maybe if that neural arch is intact enough, if we can get that sort of shift correction. Um, like I said, some patients, they just can't tolerate it and you have to kind of work your way into it. Um, yeah, I started with just prone laying because yep. he couldn't even do an extension, couldn't do a mini press up and the <clears throat> and front some side of it's because was a of- little rounded so he was very favorably in extension when he was on his tummy mm-hmm. when some of it's because they when you're when you're trying to have him do it by pressing up the the moving the table is a much more passive thing so there's less muscular things there's less less involvement of them having to do it themselves that just would have been my first thought is let's see if let's see if we strike gold here with this sort of thing and, and maybe we come out on top with that um I mean, again, it would it would require that it's a pure anterior shift. It would require an intact neural arch, um, and it would require that you know s- that there's no substantial stenotic changes, or if the disc issues have also become so chronic that they're actually physically getting in the way of extension. Um, so that would have been my first thought. Um, like I said, I don't know that that would have necessarily changed things, but that's where I would have gone with it. Um, because the, the the two differentials that you have is some sort of central protrusion or some sort of shift. Those are the two things that from my, the way my head's working right now, those are the two things that I can think of from a differential diagnosis standpoint. Did, can you think of anything else, Dave? No, I mean, those are the two things that are the most, you know, factor. This patient is going to, going to be very tough. And so this idea is like, you know, has he had steroid treatments? Has he had anything else that he may need to get him over this acute hump? You know, this individual is going to be very challenging. So I think your idea of, you know, being an advocate or a mediator for here are the other things that you need to be able to do, you know, within this within this realm. You know, my thoughts aren't, aren't too dissimilar. It's like that idea of finding the position of ease, what Eric is talking about with that extension position. Can I move him in? Can we move into a position of extension or sitting or a different thing, you know, that that 
decreases the symptoms or is at least a neutral. Because for him, you're really at that point looking for an anti. Okay, can I move him in a way that doesn't increase his pain? Because he's yeah. probably, you know, responding to pain with everything. So what is my pathway into the person? You know, my long game is going to be that idea of, okay, multifidi activation, which could be with, you know, you're looking at exercise, dry needling with stim, you know, NMES, you know, whichever is the, the, the thing that suits what you where you are best to try and downregulate it. Yeah. You know, these individuals too, it's, I look at them in 360, it's, I need to understand, okay, what position are you in when you sleep? You know, how do you sit during the day? What's your preferred standing position? You know, what do you look like when you're walking? You know, is there any factor in there, which I can attribute to increased, you know, lumbopelvic stress? And can I modify, can I find something modifiable, like by looking at his whole day from the time he gets out of bed to the time he goes to sleep and wakes up in the morning? Is there, are there factors in there? that I can address that can have a, a big impact by doing little things with them. And what I was gonna type in next is the idea that is a long view on this person. It's knowing that, hey, listen, your next couple of weeks, two weeks are gonna be rough, you know, but then you're gonna get, you have a good chance you're gonna get past this, either with injections, with, with something else, with, you know, some type of intervention or just purely time is on our side. So what do we do to improve this mechanism? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, the the bonus of doing of trying the extension stuff or in, in trying to make it as passive as possible is it would treat both problems, right? So mm -hmm. if it is a central disc issue, yeah, that's what the treatment is is extension. If it's an anterior shift, well, that's also that's also the treatment. So you really can't, you can't go horribly wrong with trying to focus on that sort of thing and make it as passive as possible. Um, there is a posterior shear test that i'll show you guys um when we get to when we get to the actual course um it's one of the it's one of the specific stress tests that uh jim jim is not a huge fan of them anymore um but i use i use most of them for other diagnostic processes other than looking for instability and i've actually used several of them as types of treatment so we'll we'll discuss those things um it's something that you can do in sitting um, it's actually something that you can do in side lying. So again, we'll we'll remind me and we'll we'll discuss it in relationship to this type of patient when we get to the class here in a couple of weeks. Um, but yeah, I mean that's that's the yeah. benefit of that thought process. Is it's like, well, if it's this thing, then I'm going to do this. I'm going to do extension. If it's this other possibility, well, I'm I'm still going to do extension. So, eh, my diagnosis doesn't have to be perfect in that situation because the treatment doesn't change. Um, uh, regardless of which one ends up being the actual pathology. But again, looking at a patient that's that difficult to maneuver, that's heavy set, that's obviously not 100% invested in the recovery process, um, it, it's tough, you know? I mean, it's, it's and you, you can't take it personally when they say, you know, I'm not getting any better because I think we've all had that patient that comes in and you're just like, okay, this is what the issue is. Like, we'll do these couple of things. You should start feeling better. And they come in a couple of days later and they're just like, nothing's changed. This is terrible. You know, you're not doing anything right. And, you know, they immediately start blaming you for the fact that nothing's changed. And it's been two days, three days, even a week. And it's just like, well, what, you know, what have you been doing? I had a patient just earlier this week came in to me, um, you know, real severe back pain, sorrow week and a half ago, then is like, oh, I'm, I'm going to be out of town for, for, five, six days, comes back and there, she was on a skiing trip. And it's just like, well, it was so much worse. And I'm just like, well, yeah, but you just went skiing for five straight days. You, you, when you came in here the first time, you could barely stand on two feet. Like, what did you think was going to happen going, you going skiing for five straight days? But it's definitely not her fault, right? It's always going to be on the healthcare practitioner that, you know, wasn't able to fix it in in a hour eval slot, right? So you can't take that sort of stuff personally, even as much as you want to sometimes, mm -hmm. um, because patients that they, they don't, the fact that we call them patients, they don't have a lot of patients, um, and and that's frustrating. But it's unfortunately the the way of the world. So you shouldn't feel like you failed the person. Odds are you were probably doing the right things and it would have gotten there eventually or at least improved eventually. And they just didn't they didn't have the wherewithal to to stick to it. That that's not your fault. 
Yeah, I appreciate your guys' input. Sorry to take up so much time with this. He, I mean, you know, I told him to be doing prone laying. He wouldn't even do it at home. So, you know, like the the compliance there wasn't yeah. wasn't that great. I knew I knew I was losing him. You know, visit three, visit four. I kept being like, give it time, give it to you know. And I knew I was losing him. So when he finally quit, I, it's you know, you can only do what what your patient's willing to let you do. Well, and at a certain point with patients like that, if they're not going to, if you're like, this is the best path, like, I need you to do this extension stuff. I need you to do it consistently. I need you to avoid flexed positions. Don't, don't round your back out. And they're not willing to do it at a certain point when they quit on you. Some patients, it's just like, thank God, I don't have to deal with that anymore. You know, because if they're not willing to help themselves, how do they expect us to do it for them? Right. So don't get too worked up about it. Um, anyway. That, that is stuff that I think is important to, to look at, though, because because we can when we look at this sort of stuff and we think disc pathology, chronic disc pathology, it will progress to instability eventually. Right. Instability, if left unchecked, will eventually progress into stenosis. That's just the natural course of these things when when we have back trauma. Right. So right here, the trauma occurs eventually over time. It's going to progress to this stage. This thing is going to sit there banging around on things, creating scar tissue. Eventually, it's going to progress to this thing. And okay? so I do want to let me look at this and see how much more we got here. I apparently was very thorough with this thing. Um, but we may just we may spend some time going over some of this during the class because we've got some things like the exam process here. Come on. This is stuff that we will go over over and over and over again during the course locking is another thing that we'll go over during the course we don't necessarily have to get to all of that um, while we're going through these things but i do want to look at these real quick over the next few minutes so this mm -hmm. is the common presentation for a poster lateral protrusion right so this is like the level one no other complications very simple um, type of presentation that should that should just pop into your head when somebody says disc protrusion, right? So looking at this, we're going to look at the posture here. They're going to be very antalgic. They're going to tend to deviate away from um, the actual uh, peripheralized symptoms, right? So they're going to have leg symptoms with this. Um, they're going to deviate away from that sort of thing in order to take pressure off that tissue, right? The, um, they'll tend to be in a little more of a flexed position, kind of trying to move, trying to to stay again, stay away from the posterior elements, which is where the the protrusion would be. Um, they don't want to sit. We were talking about that because the flexion tends to force the either the protrusion more posteriorly, or more likely, what's happening is we're tensioning the neurologic tissue over the top of the protrusion, right? So if this is the protrusion, it's going posteriorly like this, and we've got the nerve coming down around behind it. If we pull that nerve tight, right? If we pull down, it's going to push the nerve into that protrusion. So it's going to tend to worsen the peripheral symptoms, the, the leg symptoms. Um, and again, they'll, they'll have some difficulty weight bearing on that affected limb because they're going to want to keep the knee flex. They're going to want to keep tension off of those neurological structures. Okay. Active range of motion. A lot of times with disc protrusions, the active range of motion is going to be the most diagnostic thing that we can find. Right. So if we have them bend forward, again, tensioning that neurologic tissue, kind of pulling that tight over that protrusion, it will tend to increase the leg symptoms, the leg pain. Okay. Extension, then, if we go backward into extension, we're going to start compressing the damaged disc tissue, right? And again, we're, we're expecting these patients to come in after an incident. Somebody's picking something up out of the trunk of their car. Ding, there's something with their back. Um, doesn't tend to immediately become problematic. Um, you know, it's kind of one of those like, oh, I'm a little stiff, but you can kind of get through your day sort of things. It's the next morning they wake up after the inflammation has had a chance to accumulate, right? Usually takes 12 to 24 hours for uh, substantial inflammation to, to propagate in a particular area. 
Um, so it's that next morning, they have a tough time getting out of bed. They're starting to notice the ridiculous stuff, the stuff, paresthesias and the pain into the limb. Um, so compression of that damaged disc tissue will hurt locally where the disc is, where the disc tissue is in the lower back. So extension will tend to produce local low back pain. Flexion will tend to reproduce uh, the peripheralized leg symptoms. Okay. With that in mind, if we bent side bend the trunk away from that, it will tend to also tension that neurologic tissue and then reproduce leg pain. If we side bend toward um, that sort of position, um, toward the where the disc lesion would be, it'll also tend to increase the lower back, the local lower back pain. Okay, so those sort of things would be our active range of motion testing that we can just do in standing. And again, it may be the only thing we really get through with patients like this as far as true objective testing, because they're going to be difficult to position in other, for other tests. Neurological examination, um, this should really say plus or minus. Um, it depends on the size of the protrusion. Um, but with a significant protrusion, we would expect fatigable weakness in a myotomal pattern. Again, so would be positive, say if it's an L5 lesion, affecting the L5 nerve root, we would expect to see fatigable weakness of the hallux extensor um, and the hip abductors, things like that, right? Same myotomal distribution, both L5 muscles, but different peripheral nerve distributions, okay? It has to be different peripheral nerve distributions because if we're, if I go in and I start testing the um, you know, small toe extensors, those are more probably L4 than they are um, L5. They, they have the same peripheral nerve as the hallux extensor, so it doesn't really tell me much. It could be a peripheral nerve lesion at that point, okay? Loss of sensation along the dermatome. You guys are probably seeing this stupid thing here too, aren't you, from my... Um, along the dermatome, again, probably dealing with very vague borders here. Um, because of the overlap of different my uh, different dermatomes, um, the area of paresthesia, the area of anesthesia should be very small, should be very much toward the very distal end of the dermatome um, versus a peripheral nerve lesion, a sense, peripheral sensory nerve lesion will have a much wider um, area of sensory loss and much sharper borders, right? It'll be very well defined, okay? Um, reflexes, we would expect if we have fatigable weakness and uh, dermatomal uh, sensory loss, we would also expect diminished reflexes because that's essentially testing both the muscle response and the sensation response, okay? Reflexes, I don't do a ton of in the clinic unless I'm really struggling to get a good diagnostic marker on something. Um, it's more of a correlation type of test for me, um, but it is good to know how to do them. Um, again, probably have a positive slump test, straight leg raise. Uh, Lasegue's test is essentially a sideline straight leg raise. It's not one that I use in the clinic very much. Um, this is one, the prone knee flexion test that we have to take into consideration because anything above um, even L4 would not be tensioned with a slump test. It's going to be tensioned by stressing the femoral nerve, um, which means we would have to actually produce hip extension. Um, as opposed to hip flexion. Um, so we have to take that in consideration. We'll talk more about that when we go into the when we go into the actual lab. Um, oh boy, we got all kinds of stuff down here. Um, as far as how to treat this, this is the this is the basic uh, functional anatomy of a disc lesion. Basically, what we get is we get an alteration of pressure gradients between the disc and between the vertebra. They should even out when we go into a flexed position because of compression of the basal vertebral veins underneath the posterior longitudinal ligament. Um, if we have increased pressure in the disc compared to the vertebra, it will tend to make the, those tissues painful. Um, so again, the compression test, things of that sort of nature would tend to be positive. Um, you guys can look through this if you need to here. Um, the idea is getting into the treatment. Extension is the best mechanism here to overcome hydrostatic pressure um, with the osmo or overcome osmotic pressure. Basically, the idea that the fluid is just going to dissipate into open spaces around it. 
but if we produce hydrostatic pressure by compressing that fluid, it's going to force it back into the areas where there is um, relief for that. And that's into some of the lymphatic vessels, some of the venous vessels within the ver vertebra itself. Okay, um, so that's a common presentation for a disc lesion. Segmental dysfunction or an obvious instability, the posture is going to be much different. So these two things, probably the two most common things that you're going to see coming into your clinic, disc lesions and instability or segmental dysfunction, you're going to have a much more variable posture. They may hate extension. They may crave flexion positions. Um, they may be very braced where they're kind of just holding on for dear life with whatever musculature they can get to go uh, to help protect them. Um, and they may also have some sort of shift here. Again, that, that would suggest significant breakdown, intersegmental breakdown but oftentimes they will not have leg pain with that. If they do have leg pain, it tends to be more anterior, it tends to be more in the groin or down the medial portion of the thigh, things like that. Um, because of the tissue that's actually irritated with that is more the um, iliolumbar ligament. And that's actually, begins life as a portion of the L2 multifidi. So it has a reference to the L2 um dermatome, which would be more of that anterior groin area and in, in, into the, into the um, medial thigh. But generally, these patients will dislike extension. They, it makes them much more unstable, tends to recreate more pain. Flexion is a position of relief. So again, you're seeing that these two things are basically the cardinal opposites of each other. Side bending will depend on what structure is damaged. Rotation is very typically painful, but only in one direction versus with a disc lesion, it'll tend to be painful in both directions. Neurologic exam, pretty much we're going to end up with no fatigable weakness. It's going to be very velocity dependent, probably no sensation changes, and the reflexes are going to actually be elevated in most cases because of the facilitation effect that comes with it. Okay. Referred pain into the limb, but it's typically going to be more with that sustained or repetitive movement that we were talking about previously. It's going to require a bit of stress to build up, you know, that summative effect, that gating mechanism that we talk about sometimes with pain science. Um, so it won't be the instantaneous type of pain that we see with radicular lesions. Okay. Um, stenosis, I, hopefully you guys are pretty, pretty good with this. They'll tend to like flexed positions, tend to dislike extension positions, especially with activity. Um, typically they don't have any neurologic signs, any of that sort of stuff. Um, but we need to differentiate this from claudication with activity. Basically that's the bike test. If we have, them, if we have them ride a bike, if it's claudication, it's still going to get bad, right? We're still giving that muscle demand, that vascular demand, but if it's stenosis, it won't be bothered because the back is flexed, right? So hopefully this is a pretty obvious one. And again, we can kind of review these things as we go forward. Um, anything you want to add here, Dave, since we're kind of out of time? You're muted. Yeah. No, as far as the summary, I mean, those are pretty good summaries of the conditions that are going to see. I like the, uh, like you should talk about the segmental dysfunction, extension, even Bogdog even talked about one of the, one of the things that can cause that as well. If it's a subluxation, they talk about the meniscoid even getting trapped in there. And, you know, if you look at Bogdog's work on that, that's the model he kind of used of that person who'd be more extension intolerant. As oh, yeah. the set joint would go to come back and glide and, you know, pinch or get on or trap the meniscus. So that's just another model of subluxation that they, they talk about there is the meniscoid becoming trapped versus mm -hmm. the joint stuck at its end range. Yeah, we talked about that a bit. And we'll talk about it more in this class as well when we get into, you know, some of the models of manipulation and how they how we expect it to to work for us in our in our favor. So. All right. We've got what one more week. Um, hopefully, I guess, I guess I can kind of finish up some of this stuff next week if you want to, if we want to do that. Yeah, um, I think I'll get stuff to be lectures and, you know, see what we can, you can put in here. So hopefully what it yeah. is, is you can move a little bit more efficiently during the class, yeah. have a little more time for review. And I'll probably miss that. Well, I, I'll miss the Thursday, Thursday, the mm -hmm. Thursday of the week um, of the class because I'll be traveling. So okay. you guys won't. That one, we, we may end up just trying to, you know, maybe do a prep case. I may look at a lumbar case in that week just to kind of. Sounds good. Lecture, and then, then work into a case. Cool. Good. 
All right, then we'll talk <laughs> next week. We'll try and get through the rest of this. Dave, can you just post the last three weeks with this one, please? You got it. I was working on the video right before this. I'm gonna try and I'll try and get that done. And just email me tomorrow if I haven't emailed it out yet. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Just keep on me. Thank you. Thanks. See you guys.